All right, folks, if you have your Bible, and I hope you have, turn to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. Book of Hebrews, chapter number 4 and verse 12. The divine text says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Lord, bless this book now, your word as it goes forth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There's a place in the Old Testament where it says that when your word goes forth, whether they believe or they reject it, let it be known that the word of God has gone forth, that it will accomplish what it pleases. I firmly believe that. I believe there's no book in the world like this book. There's absolutely none. I've got a pile of books, but there's nothing like the Bible. And the scripture testifies of itself and says, first of all, that it's quick. It's alive. When you believe the Bible, you take something living into your soul. It's a living thing. Being alive, therefore, it shall bring forth life and fruit and will cause faith to be born within the soul, heart and soul of the person. You cannot generate faith. It's not in your ability. Faith's the gift of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is why Satan fights the scripture so much. You remember that angel of light we talked about? You remember that minister of righteousness? Well, he or she's in the pulpit today and they're doing everything in their power to make people doubt the scripture or even hide it from them. And uh, for that reason, they know that power, there's power in the Bible. The first thing that Mao Zedong did over there in China was to take the Bible away from the people. This is what they've done in North Korea, take the Bible away from the people. And the reason they do that is because the entrance of thy word giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. The word of God, when it comes into the soul of a man, it, it illumines that soul. It gives light to that person. But there's more, there's more than that. And this is the part that you have to think about with me tonight. You say, what is that? It says it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The scripture says in the book of first, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter number 2, because they love not the truth but took pleasure in unrighteousness, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they may believe a lie and be damned. They rejected the truth, didn't want the truth. Amen. The Bible will tell you whether you want the truth or not. When you open up the Bible, begin to read it, and you realize or understand or feel like you're getting nothing from it, maybe it's because you want nothing from it. But if you want something, the Bible's there to give you something. There's more there than you could ever imagine. There's more there than you could ever consume in ten lifetimes. The Scripture is a living thing. Now, I believe the Bible. I believe it from cover to cover. There's a lot of it I don't understand, folks. I don't, do not understand it, but I still believe it. Can you believe what you don't understand? I believe the record God gave of his word. Yeah. I believe it. And this is what the apostle talks about over there in 1 John chapter number 5. If you believe the record that God gave of his word, it doesn't mean you have to be a master of it, but you believe it. But if you don't believe the record that God gave, which is his word, what are you calling God? You're calling him a liar. And there's nothing more personal to God than to look at his face, shake your fist, and call him a liar, the greatest of all sins, because you've rejected the source of truth. He is the truth. And the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here 2,000 years ago, was the living word of God. He was alive. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only Father, full of grace and truth. Matthew chapter number 26 and verse number 61 says tonight, and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? Which is it which these witnesses against thee? 
which these witness against thee. But Jesus held his peace. Now, you know, you've been told to witness and testify in every situation. Not necessarily. He didn't. Just follow through me with me tonight. He didn't. The Apostle Paul said an effectual door would be open for me. There's a time to be silent. The Lord Jesus Christ was silent. Why? Because this was, this was what you would call heartless ecclesiasticism. So what is that? That's just a big word that means these are the comings and the goings and the thoughts and sayings of churchianity. Churchianity. How many of you have ever been around churchianity? Churchianity is rooted. I mean, it's deep. And a lot of people know all the cliches. They know how to perform in front of people. And this is what's going on here. The Lord Jesus would not be party to what was happening, so he remained silent. This is before Caiaphas. We found his bone box. It's down there in, uh, down there in a cave. And Caiaphas, of course, was the uh, priest. And uh, his bone box was, uh, is uh, extra-biblical uh, uh, source of authority to support the inspiration of the Scripture. He really lived. In the book of uh, Luke chapter 23 and verse number 9, then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. This is before Herod. And Herod wanted to play with him. Oh, yeah, he, he was curious. He'd heard a lot about him. So, you know, to satisfy his curiosity, he thought he would, he would, he would patronize this man. And so he played with him. And so what did the Lord Jesus do? He didn't answer him a word. He answered him nothing. said, I'll not be party to it. Did, uh, did Herod need to be witnessed to? Oh, yeah, he was witnessed to. That witness to him. You see, your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Amen. Who can know it? The Lord said, I search the heart, try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Scripture is the only thing that can really search the heart and try the reins. Say, so why do you preach a message like this tonight? Because I want to come down to truth and reality. For years and years and years, I thought the church was nothing but a joke. I did. It's just a big joke. My wife would make me go to church with her, and when it was over with, she had to endure all the criticisms that I had that I would I would <laughs> I would give her. I, I mean, I let it fly. You mean you didn't believe? No, I was I was I was, I was an agnostic. Didn't know the Lord. I used to play pinball machine while they were having church. Anything I could get away from church with. I didn't have any use for church. Wasn't anything in there for me. Nothing till he came to me. And that's something that you have to deal with. You know, you may be an agnostic tonight. You may not believe in salvation all that. That's your, issue. That's your, that's your privilege. But you cannot explain what happened to me because he came to me. And that changed me in 1973. That's been 50 years ago. 50 years. 50 years. He came to me. When he came to me, he brought something to me that I had never experienced in this world. You know what happened from that moment on? I wanted the truth. I wanted the truth. And I set about to find the truth. I've been on a 53-year journey seeking out the truth. Amen. Amen. Seeking it out. Amen. I want to know the truth. Am I mistaken in what I believe tonight? You know, is, is this real? I mean, some of the doctrines that I hold. So I double check them. I read them and pray over them. I want to know what, what do I believe? Why do I believe it? Do I believe the truth? Do you do that? Or are you one that calls up your, one that calls up your, uh, your denominational Haman and says, uh, and a brother so-and-so, what do we believe about this? So what kind of garbage? Do you live like that? Do you live like that? In other words, what do I need to what do I need to believe to get along, and to become uh, to become part of the system, and to prosper? You know, I don't want to get out. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to say anything that might uh, that might cause uh, disfavor on me. So what am I supposed to believe, brother so and so? Isn't that sad? That's sick. It is. You'll never get to the truth like that. Before Pilate, he said this. John chapter 19, verse 9. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? Where'd you come from? Who are you? Now, Pilate was concerned about one thing. 
What was that? The Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. That's all he cared about, the peace, keeping the peace. Here's Caesar today. Nothing's really changed with Caesar. Keeping the peace. When's the last time you ever heard a policeman referred to as a peace officer? How many of you have never heard them referred to as a peace officer? That's what they used to call them, peace officers. How many of you remember that? They certainly did. What was the point? Keep the peace. <laughs> Keep the peace. So Pilate said, uh, where'd you come from? What, are, what kind of a guru are you? This was, um, this was just simply curiosity in a critical manner. Don't you know who I am, Pilate said? I have the power to set you free or I have the power to crucify you. Don't you know who? And the Lord Jesus looked him right in the eye and said, you don't have any power over me except it were given to thee from above. That's what he said. But at this particular time, he didn't answer him a word. Not a word. Not a word. So in the book of John chapter number 8 and verse number 6, this is a time when he is silent and the crowd screaming around him. He doesn't say a word, but it's quite remarkable at how he handles it. John 8, 6, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. You see that? There's the motive. There's the motive. The word of God is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the intent. Motive. That's the motive, the intent. They don't want the truth. All they wanted was condemnation to justify themselves. And they wanted to destroy him in the process. So here's what he did. They said, tempting him that they might have it to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground yeah. as though he heard them not. Amen. You get on the line and you, you'll find a, an amazing number of people who say, why didn't Jesus ever write anything? A lot of people don't think, did, they apparently don't know that he ever wrote anything. Yeah. He didn't write, well, he didn't write any books. He left no letters. He left no engravings in stone or anything of that nature. This is the only time in the Bible that he writes something. And he wrote it in dirt. You know, the dirt, where do we come from? The dirt, this is your origin. This is where you all came from. I'm going to write right here where you came from in the dirt. That's quite a remarkable thing. What did he write? We don't know what he wrote. So he only wrote one time, and we don't know what he wrote. If the Holy Ghost had wanted us to know, he would have told us. Right? Amen. Right. Amen. He would have told us. That's a lot of things in the Bible like that. If he wanted you to know, he'd tell you. So what do you do? You just take it for what it says, and that's it. What I do is I look at the character of Christ and their character, and I say, I'm going to take the Lord's side. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to take his side. Yeah, I don't have to know all the details about the woman taken in adultery. I don't have to know the lives that all these people lived. I don't know what sin they were all guilty of. I'll take his side. And you know something tonight? I'll take his side every time. Amen. I'll take his side against you and I'll take his side against me. Yeah. How about you? Amen. I'll take his side. Yes, sir, I will. Because he's always right and I'm always wrong. <laughs> in the book of uh, Luke chapter 18... He's not silent here. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You know, we've prayed long and hard for revival. I'd like to see revival. Churches get together and they pray for revival. They think it's some kind of a formula. They say it, they think it's some kind of a special gift. Revival's right before every one of us tonight. It's right there. You just read it. If you would humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, your life would completely be turned around. You would be revived immediately. But why don't you do it? Because we're stubborn. We're stubborn and we're self-righteous. Well, I'm not preacher. That's sir. You just confessed. You are. Because this sinner said, God be merciful to me. I'm not going to try to plead my case. I'm not going to try to argue with you. 
I'm not going to try to say somebody pushed me into what I did. I'm not going to say it wasn't my fault. Lord, I did it. It's my fault. Forgive me. It's simple. It really is. But you know what? We have a hard time dealing with the simple things, don't we? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. When you read the Bible, and the Bible crosses something that you're doing, and, you know, it points it out to your heart. And, <laughs> and sometimes your heart may begin to beat faster, break into a cold sweat, uh, say, I'm done with this, and so forth and so on. Why don't you let it speak to you? It's good for you to be drug across the coals every once in a while. It is. It's good for you. It's good for you. Now, he hears this, too, in Exodus chapter 22, verse 22. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. He hears the cry of the orphans and the widows. Please, please, please leave the orphans and widows alone. You mess with them and you're going to get in trouble with God. He has a heart and he has an ear for the orphans and for the widows. You don't know what a widow feels till you become a widow. You don't know what it is to be an orphan unless you've been an orphan. And unless you know that, you have no idea. But if you do know that, then you're a prayer warrior for them. You can intercede for little children. You can intercede on their behalf. Yes, you can. And it's, uh, you know, it's an educational thing to watch little children. It's an amazing thing. See, little children aren't like us. They don't hide their emotions. They don't sneak around and do things. I mean, they're, they're spontaneous in the way they do things. Yes, they are. If they love you, they'll grab a hold of you. They will. They'll come right up to you. That's right. They're not interested in the peer pressure. Little children, are, they're, they're, just, they're just genuine. And this is the thing the Lord loves about them. He loves that genuineness. Yes, he does. It's quite a remarkable thing. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 21, verse 17, he hears the voice of a child. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of the heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. She'd been run off. Now, how old, how old was Ishmael? This is who he's talking about. That's right. Exactly right. He was a teenager. But as far as God's concerned, he was a child. He was a lad. And, uh, and he heard the voice of this child. God's not in the business of destroying people. He came to save us. Amen. In Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 17, it says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Psalm, one, Psalm 14, 2 says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Yeah, yeah seek God. But uh, that's, that's, I don't know of anything more admirable and higher in a person's purpose than to seek the Lord. The scripture warns us that seek him while he may be found. Your heart can be hardened. Circumstances tomorrow may completely change everything about your life. But you can seek the Lord. And folks, he's the answer to every problem we have. Right. It's the Lord. How many has ever heard of a man-centered gospel? Man-centered. I try to, try to get this point across. You remember when I told you this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ-centered. Christ is the center, the purpose, the reason for everything. It's the Son of God. And this is, this is a journey we're on. One day we'll see him as he is. Yeah. One day we will behold the Son of God in his glorified state. But man-centered gospel is a seductive type thing. There are many of them. They say things like, God wants to make you rich and prosperous in this life. That's a man-centered gospel. Yes, the people preaching about you becoming rich and prosperous become rich and prosperous themselves. Because you give them seed faith. You sow into their ministry. How many ever heard that term before? Sow into this ministry. That's right. And this is I, probably to a fault, I'm sure, and I have to confess it tonight. I say very little about money, very little. But do you know what? God blesses this church with money. That's an amazing thing. He does. He does. But I say very little about it because my focus is not on money. 
Have you noticed the board on the back that tells us how much the offering was last Sunday? Look around on the board back on the back back there. <coughs> it's not there, is it? No, it's not there. Here's why. You should do it from a willing heart, and you should do it as you become mature in the Lord, and you realize that what God has given you, God gave you, and that he can bless it, and that he can bless 90% that you keep after you've given him 10 and he can make that 90% worth 200%. Plain words, the Lord cannot, you cannot outgive him. You can't do it. You cannot outgive God. And that's just, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm quiet about it a lot of time because I don't want people to come here and think we're about money. We're not about money. And ever since I've been on the radio, we have never charged for a tape or anything of that nature. And we have offered cassette tapes for decades over, over uh, uh, the broadcast. Uh, on uh, on uh, WKXV radio and through TV and all the rest of it, any other uh, that we have, the Voice of Calvary, we do not charge for tapes. People take care of it. Nine at times out of ten, they'll send an offering for the tape, but we make it plain. If you want this tape, ask for it, and we'll give it to you free of charge. Amen. We're not in the money business, and God blesses, and he has blessed God wants to heal you of every physical and emotional ailment. You ever hear that? It's all about you. You ever notice? Preaching today is about you. It's about you, see? It's about me. No, it's not. It's not about me. It's about Christ. It is. One of the biggest problems with folks that come to church is they got too much of themselves. They're full of themselves. That's all they think about themselves. If you begin to focus your mind on the Lord, been through a lot of hard th times in the last few weeks, I keep asking you to pray for my family. My family needs prayer. How do I handle it? I focus my mind on Christ. He is the answer. Yes. I don't know how he will answer, but he is the answer. And I get peace in doing that. Do you do that? That's the only out you have. That's your hope. You put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him. Talk to him. Meditate upon him. Listen to him. And he becomes the purpose in your life. And then God wants to provide for whatever need you feel you have. They do surveys, communities. Mega churches will go out and say, what do you feel like you need from God? Felt needs. They build the church and its ministry and its so forth and so on on felt needs. Folks, it's not about what I feel, the need that I feel. It's what he knows I need, not what I feel like I need. The Lord knows that we have need of these things. What we need is Christ. Amen. All the rest of these things will come in place. They'll come in due place. They'll come in time, at the right time and the right place. But that's a man-centered gospel, man-centered. It's not exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. How many's ever noticed that in some places? Christ is not exalted. He's not lifted up. And this is until the day I leave this world, I have been firmly called to preach Christ preeminent, above and beyond all things, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the reason for us to live. Psalm 72, for he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the soul of the needy. Now I'm going to close with something tonight and I'm going to make you think. This is to make you think. Turn to Luke 7. I want you to read it with me. You need to see it with your eyes. Luke chapter number 7 and verse number 31. This is um, a lot of times an overlooked lesson that is so, so powerful. Luke chapter 7 and verse number 31. The Lord said, Whereunto then shall I like, liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? He answers his own question. They're likened to children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. They're talking to each other. It's almost like they're playing with each other. See, in other words, we piped, we played, we danced, but we couldn't get a response out of you. See, no response. 
The other side said, we did the same thing and there was no response out of you. All right. Now look what the Lord does with that. Look at verse number 33. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And ye say, he hath a what? Oh, so you rejected John the Baptist. Okay. He didn't fit. All right. So you said he had a devil. All right. He's demon possessed. Same crowd. Look what they said about Christ. Same crowd. Look what they said about him. Verse 34. The son of man is come eating and drinking. And ye say, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. See? You know what that means? That means that any doesn't make any difference what I do for you, the Lord says. You're not going to believe. That's what that means. It doesn't matter. You've chosen not to believe. You will not be persuaded. You will not reason with a rational mind. You're already set in what you're going to do. This is what he said. This is what this means. But look what he said. But wisdom is justified of her children. Of all her children. So what does that mean? You can talk to me about how much you love the Lord Jesus Christ all you want to. But if your life is full of brokenness, death, sorrow, suffering, and dying, okay, you're playing. You're playing games. There's no fruit of the Spirit. So therefore, wisdom is justified of her children. You're not one of them. At least not during this time of rebellion. In plain words, the Lord Jesus says to these people, let me tell you something. The words I have given to you, they are words of truth. They're the truth of God. And you may not believe it <coughs> and refuse to accept it. But to those that do, the wisdom of God will be manifest forth in their lives. And the way they live will justify the truth of what was preached. That's what he says. It'll justify the truth of what was preached. He says, wisdom is justified of all her children. So you hear someone say, well, if I could see someone healed, or if I could see someone, some great miracle performed, then I would believe. Not necessarily. Not necessarily at all. Because there were those who were sent forth to spy out the Lord and his disciples. They were sent by Caiaphas and Annas and the rest of them. And in John chapter number 11, they stood there and watched Lazarus come forth from the dead. They watched him. There's no question. It's indisputable. He was raised from the dead. Did they believe? No. They ran back to their masters and told them what had happened as unbelievers. The apostle John said, these things are written that you might believe. Thomas, come over here now. Reach hither thy finger and put it in my side. And touch these scars. Be not faithless, but believing. Thomas dropped his head and said, my Lord and my God. That was enough for Thomas. He didn't need any more. The Lord said, Thomas, you believe because you've seen. And he didn't question the genuineness of his faith. You believe because you've seen. But Thomas, Charles Lawson 2,000 years later is going to believe. And he hadn't seen. <laughs> Blessed are they that believe and have not seen. Now, Preacher Lawson, you really believe Charles, that, 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 uh, that, that the Lord Jesus knew that I'd live? Well, are you kidding? The Bible says in Isaiah, he shall see his seed and shall prosper. Oh, yeah, he'll see his seed, every last one of us in his house today. The seed of the Lord. He knew your name. He knew when you would be born. And he knew when you'd believe. And he rejoiced in that. For that, for that joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, yes, despising the shame. It is set down at the right hand yes. of God. Oh, yeah. He was willing to endure hell on a tree so that I could be saved. So are you saying, preacher, that you believe? Oh, you better believe I believe. I don't have to convince myself I believe. I believe. If you're, con if you're, if you're arguing and trying to convince yourself tonight that you believe the Bible, what's your problem? Ask God to show you what's going on in your soul. 
trust him. He will. Yeah. Open up your heart yeah. and say, Lord, what's going on with me? What's my problem? And he'll show you his way, his time, his place. Yeah. He'll show you. But here's one tonight that has no problem. I believe the book. <laughs> I do. I believe that Bible. <laughs> I believe it. Isn't that a wonderful book? I believe the Bible. You tell me, preacher, you believe everything. Yeah, I believe every word of it. And I open it up, and I don't wrestle with some unbelief, some agnostic type this or that. When I open that Bible and I begin to read it, I'm listening to God. I'm not critiquing the book. I let the book critique me. Amen. Discerner. Kritikos is the word translated discerner there in Hebrews 4.12. That's where we get our word critic. Kritikos is the Greek word. It's literally a transliteration. What's a transliteration? You take the Greek letter and put it into English. And that's what you're doing. You don't translate it. You simply take it from Greek into English. And so it says kritikos. You can go into English, critique. Same thing, see? And he discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Let the book critique you. Yeah. Amen. Do you believe the Bible? Amen. I believe the Bible. God, get, he, didn't leave us, he didn't leave us alone, didn't leave us ignorant. Yeah. I believe that blessed book. Yeah. Father, bless this holy book. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the book. I know that word's alive. It's in my soul, and it puts life in my soul. I may get down. I may get become depressed. Lord, I may wander away from you. I may stumble and fall. I may come up and com commit some sin that, that when I do it, 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 it amazes me. Yet I believe this book, and it brings me back to you. In Jesus' name tonight, bless these dear folk and help them, Lord. And may they search their heart and their soul by letting you do the searching of the heart and the soul. And they'll come out right. In Jesus' name. Nobody's looking. Anybody raise a hand tonight and say, Preacher, I want you to pray for me. Because I, I want what you're talking about. I want, to be, I want to be able to get back in my Bible, read it, and believe it. I've, just, I've, been, I've been reading too much junk. God bless you, brother. I've, been, I've, been, I've gotten a hold of some agnostics and some atheists and some rationalists and all this and that and this and that. God bless you here, brother. And it's beginning to waver my belief in the Bible. It's affecting me. Well, let's... Let's, let's pray tonight the Holy Ghost will see that hand and see that heart, and he'll begin to work in your heart. He will. That's where he does his work. He works in the heart. He spends very little time with the flesh. He simply goes through it to the heart. Anybody else, raise your hand. Say, pray for me, preacher. All right, Lord, I pray for them. Every hand that went up. My desire tonight, Lord, is to help people, help them. And, Father, may they take this book in their hands and believe it, embrace it, and then ask you to give them wisdom in it. And it becomes the guide of their life, the life, life, life imparted to their soul from this precious, precious book. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's stand up tonight.